I was just thinking a while ago, he's talking about they've been here 44 years, and I heard him say he just left Bible school to come here to pastor. And I remember my first church, I was right out of Bible school. I was 20 years old. And my district, I was playing the piano back in those days with a quartet. And my superintendent heard me play the piano that morning. I was walking across the stage. I had a job with the uh, Waterworks of Columbus, Georgia. I was a lab technician. And um, after I got through playing the piano that morning with a quartet, I walked across the stage and the district superintendent grabbed me by the arm and he said, John, he said, man, listen, when are you going to get in the ministry? And I gave him that pat answer, you know, well, when God opens the door. And he said, oh, great. He said, there's a door open. I'm going to tell him you're coming next Sunday. <laughs> and it was a church in Bidea, Georgia. I'm a city boy. And he said, you're going to love it. And uh, he said, they run about 40 people. And um, he said, it's in a place called Tombs County, Georgia, bloody Tombs County, Georgia. And so we went. My wife had heard me preach one time before I started pastoring. And we preached in a place called Ashburn, Georgia, right outside of where Jimmy Carter was raised in Plains, Georgia, and my wife, my new wife, had never heard me preach before, and it was horrific. <laughs> it was a country church that had all the windows raised, and I got up that morning and tried to preach, and I tell you, friend, it was, it was terrible. And while I was preaching, I was really trying to give it my best, and while I was preaching, I swallowed a fly. <laughs> and uh, I went over to the window, and I said, <laughs> And I did that three times trying to get it up, but he never came back. I could never get him back up. So I came back behind the, mount, the pulpit, tried to finish preaching. It was so bad. We got in the car, and my wife said, Honey, are you sure you're called to preach? <laughs> so we took my first church, and I remember took that church in Vidalia, Georgia. And... Uh, I, <laughs> it was my birthday. We took the church in June. And so in July, a lady invited us over for my birthday dinner. It happened to be on a Sunday. She invited us over. And me and Brenda went over there for my birthday. We had a nine-month-old son. And so this lady had us over. Her name was Sister Pittman. She was a pistol ball. She was somebody that didn't care for me much at all. And so that morning while we were, that afternoon while we were eating lunch, it was out in the country. And while we were sitting down and eating, I heard something. And in just a minute, I saw her get up from the table and she had a little curtain underneath her kitchen sink and she pulled that curtain back and there was a sitting hen right there in her house. And I leaned over to Brenda and I said, Brenda, this is my 21st birthday today. We have made it big time. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the ministry for John and Brenda Kilpatrick at Sister Pittman's house. You need to love your pastor and you need to love your pastor's wife because in today's world, to have a pastor like them is almost unheard of. To have somebody that you can trust, to have somebody that you can trust and to have somebody that you can respect and that you can be secure under their ministry, that is a very hard thing to find anymore. Before I minister today, I want to just take just a moment and I want to tell you about something that I brought with me. I don't do this to survive financially by any means, but after we're gone, hopefully we can minister to you. Back in 2019, before COVID or anything happened, it was in December of 2019, I went to the restroom in the middle of the night. I came back, laid down, and I was laying on my right side, and I flipped over in the bed, and I flipped over on my left side, and when I did, I flipped over into another world. I didn't see a vision. I never heard a voice. I never saw the Lord, never heard an angel or anything, but I just flipped over into another world. It was wonderful. And I, I don't like to use the word telep like telepathy, 
but it was, I never heard the Lord speak audibly, but I, I heard him in my spirit just as loud as if I hear myself talking right now. And the Lord said to me, he said, perilous times are coming, extremely perilous times are coming, and they're right at the door. And he said, tell the people to be prepared because he said things are going to change and they're going to change fast. He said, but tell the people not to worry and not to be afraid because I'm sending my angels to help them. And so off of that, I went in and told the church the following Sunday and just in a matter of weeks, COVID had broke out and affected the world. And um, I, I preached this series on the angels are coming. Really think you would get a lot out of it. It's an eye opener, I think, because when I got into it and began to preach it, it was like, man, I was learning right along with everybody else. It's called the angels are coming. Celestial intervention for perilous times. And so... I'd like to say more about it, but I don't want to take up my message time. This is a message I just got through preaching recently. It's on fasting, and it's a different angle from fasting that maybe you've ever heard. And um, the title of it is, When Prayer Alone Will Not Work. When Prayer Alone Will Not Work. And I think it's about five or six parts, if I'm not mistaken. It's six parts. When Prayer Alone Will Not Work. And... Uh, when I dealt with fasting, I dealt with it from an angle that when people heard it, they said, oh my goodness, that helped me so much. So I think if you'd pick up a copy of it and maybe even pass it on after you listen to it to somebody else, it'd be a blessing to them. This is what I'm preaching this morning. I'm preaching this morning on the eyes of your understanding. The eyes of your understanding. And uh, I won't be able by any means to get through with this. I'm just gonna preach on it one time. I don't think I've ever enjoyed preaching another series as much as this one. And as I said, I was learning as I preached it. And God gave it to me. And I really believe that you'll get a lot out of it and probably would want to pass it on to somebody when you get through listening to it. But right now, I want to go to the message of today. And I want to deal with the subject of the eyes of your understanding and I'm going to be conscious of the time, of course. But I just want to say that I always enjoy coming to Evangel. I love Brother Cecil, Sister Pauline. I hear Sister Pauline's about to have a birthday in a couple of weeks. <clears throat> you know what? It looks like to me you're just about ready to go on Social Security. That's what it looks like to me. And uh, Brother Sister Wiggins, God bless you guys. I love y'all so much. I, told, I texted him the other day and I said, I can't wait to come to Jacksonville this weekend to check on the Wiggins side of the Kilpatrick family <laughs> because I love the Wiggins. They're like my own family. Brother Wiggins, Brother Cecil Wiggins reminded me so much of my pastor. And Brother Gary, you're looking better than I've ever seen you look. And that's the honest truth. You really are. You really are. He walked in this morning back in the green room and I thought, uh, okay, he's looking better and I'm looking worse. <laughs> I want to speak to you today on, on the subject of the eyes of your understanding and I want to deal today with the subject of the difference between levels and dimensions. The difference between levels and dimensions. If you will, stand with me, please, for the reading of the word, and I'll let you be seated again in just a moment. We're going to go to Ephesians 1, verses 16 through 19. And as I deal with this today, I want everybody to understand. Let me say this right up front so you won't leave out of here and misquote me or misunderstand me. Whenever I'm talking about dimensions, I'm not talking about new age, okay? Say that out loud with me. He's not talking about new age. I'm not talking about anything extra biblical. I'm talking about, I'm just trying to give you a word to help you to understand where I'm trying to lead us today. I'm gonna to deal with the difference between levels and dimensions. Ephesians, the apostle Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus. Glasses. And he said, I cease not to give thanks for you 
making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, thank you very much, that the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And then in verse 18 he says this, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. Now, it's interesting, something that I found in regard to Solomon. I want you to look at this with me in Solomon or in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night and said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with you. And you have kept him for him this great kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now Solomon said, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And he said, I'm a little child. I know not how to go out and I don't know how to come in. What he was saying is, I'm totally unequipped for this job. I'm totally unprepared to be the king of Israel. I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. And here's what Solomon said. He didn't ask for wisdom. Now look at this, everybody. He didn't ask for wisdom and he did not ask for money. Look what he asked for. Give thy servant an understanding heart. Give thy servant an understanding heart. You may be seated. If you can lock in with me here just for a little while this morning, I'd like to say some things that I hope will be provocative for you, all of us, to think about. <clears throat> What is the eyes of your understanding? What is that? It's when your sight is opened, not your natural physical sight, but it's your inner sight, your inner man's sight. Now look this way and listen to what I'm going to tell you. When God begins to unlock your understanding, and he begins to open your inner eyes on the inside of you, what you come to understand will usually contradict what you may have always believed or presently believing. What is understanding? Understanding is the truth that you're standing under. Look this way, please. Understanding is the truth that you're standing under. Everybody operates under a measure of truth. On a pew in any church this morning in America, there can be 15 people on a pew. Every one of those people in those pews are all at different levels of truth. They all know the truth and they all love the Lord and they're born again on their way to heaven. But every one of those people are usually at different levels of truth. Whatever level of truth they are is the level of freedom and the level of liberty and victory that they enjoy. So understanding is usually the truth that you're standing under. Paul really believed that he was doing God's service by persecuting the church. He was persecuting the Jews for believing on Jesus. And Jesus appeared to Paul. And he basically knocked him to the ground. The Lord caused his natural eyes to be blinded so that he may open his spiritual eyes of understanding. Sometime before God can get us to understand things, he has to block other means of vision that we've always had. And I'm not talking about he's going to make you go blind, but he's going to work on 
the different levels of understanding that we've had by the things that we've come to know and see, and we're going to have to see them in a different way. And the Lord caused his eyes of understanding to open, and he immediately called Jesus Lord as soon as his eyes were open. The Lord knocked him to the ground, and immediately this man had been persecuting all these Christians for believing on Jesus, these Jewish Christians. But now, immediately, he hadn't even been on the ground three seconds. And he immediately got his eyes opened. His other eyes were darkened. He got his eyes opened, and he immediately called Jesus Lord. He turned immediately after the Lord opened the eyes of his understanding and became the great apostle Paul. God changed him from Saul to Paul. So I want you to listen to something. The only way that we can understand the things of God is to allow him, allow the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes of understanding about not just scripture, but a lot of things. A lot of things, not just scripture. If you tell your story sometime about what happened to you when you were young, if you tell your story sometime about what happened to you in such and such a place or such and such a church or such and such a family, and you tell that story in front of somebody else that was there with you when that story happened, you might be surprised that they had a different version of your story. And they have an insight into a truth that you have never really seen through the years. And when you hear it, it changes your understanding of things. Could it be that the amount of truth that you're standing under is incomplete? Could it be that the story you have believed about something that has happened to you might have been a little bit different and you have locked in on the facts as you knew them then, but those are not really the facts. Could it be that the story you have believed has influenced you for a long time and has held you in its bonds? Could it believe that something has colored your life? Could it be that something has colored the way you see a person? or the way you see God, or the way you see an experience that happened to you that really messed you up, tripped you up? And could it be that the story that you have believed is not a lie, but it may be an incomplete story? Could it be that you have a blind spot that has kept you messed up for many years because the eyes of your understanding needs to be opened and that blind spot needs to be dealt with because that blind spot is blocking the truth from freeing you up. And you allow the story that you've told yourself all these years to hold you in its sway. I can't do this, you say, because of what happened to me. I can't do this because of what they did or what they said or what I experienced, and it's a blind spot, and you've been blinded, and the devil has blinded you, even about a previous marriage, about a previous bad situation in a relationship, or whatever that may be. And to give you a good example, let me take one from the scriptures. There was a man at the pool of Bethesda, and he was there for 38 years. And Jesus walked up to this man and they had brought this man there. He had come every year for 38 years and when the angel would stir the waters, according to what they said, the legend was, when the angel stirs the waters, the first one in is healed. And so Jesus came to the pool of Bethesda and he come up to this guy and he said to him, sir, will you be made whole? And he said, well, yes, I, I would love to be made whole. But you see, every year for the last 38 years when I've got ready to step in the water, somebody has got in ahead of me and I've missed it for 38 years. Nobody's been there to help me. 
That was his story. Could I tell you something? If I had been going there 38 years and I was blind and the angel stirred the water, I'm gonna be right at the edge of the water and if nobody helps put me in, I'm gonna roll in the water. I'm gonna roll over in the pool of Siloam and I'm gonna say, help, I'm drowning! And somebody's gonna come and get me out, but I'm gonna get my healing, amen? I'm gonna get my healing. But see, his story, hear me, his story held him away from his miracle. You remember the woman with the issue of blood? The doctors told her it's hopeless. She had spent all that she had. She's going to die. The religious crowd said, you're unclean. Stay away from folks. Don't, let, don't get near people. Don't let them touch you. No medication is going to help you. No surgery. She was operating under a truth. And the truth that she was, her understanding was, the truth that she was standing under was, you're not going to get any better. This is not going to change. You're destined for this. But nothing happened to this woman that had the issue of blood until she changed her story. She said to herself when she heard of Jesus, see, her, her story was, I can't get better, no medication, no surgery. I, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just destined. But then she heard of Jesus and all of a sudden she changed her story. You see, <laughs> let me say this. When you change your story, you get a new understanding you get a new understanding that you start operating under. And so she heard Jesus and she said, if I could, you know, if I, I believe, if I could just touch that man, I believe I'd be whole. So she reached out when she was enlightened, she reached out, she got her eyes of understanding open. When she heard about him, her eyes opened up and she said, you know, I'm gonna change my story, you know, if, I believe if I could just touch him, I believe I'd be made whole. And she changed her story. You see, as long as you repeat, when you repeat a new story, you delete your old story. Could I say that again? When you repeat your old story, when you repeat a new story, rather, you delete your old story. A new story replaces your old story. You can't tell both stories at the same time. You know what I think? I think it's time for the church to stop repeating our old story and delete it and get a brand new story. Listen to me. We are now living in a time, and this is where we are. COVID helped bring this season in. We are now living in a time that is the time of the end of the age. And the Lord said in the time of the end, that everything will open up. Now listen to me carefully. There will be no mysteries in heaven. So in other words, all mysteries must be revealed before Jesus comes. Even the Bible said about the uh, book of Daniel, it said, shut up the book until the time of the end. In the time of the end, people will begin to understand the book. But it's not time to understand the book back then, but now we have entered into a time, it's time to understand the book. Now listen to this. There's other mysteries that God is about to reveal and is revealing in these last days. It wasn't time for them before, but before we get to heaven, all mysteries have got to be revealed. I want to know what God has to reveal. I want to know. I want to know what I've never known. I want to know what he's thinking. I want to know what has been kept from me because what God is about to reveal and is in the process of revealing is going to put the church over in a massive way in the last days. In other words, we're going to have to know more than we've ever known before to live victory like we've never had the victory before. Yesterday's victory is not going to suffice for today's victory. Now people are receiving things in dreams. They're receiving things and visions that the Lord is giving. Truly, truly dreams and true visions, not hot dog dreams and some kind of a make-believe vision. Now, all of a sudden, God's beginning to give his people different parts of the world, including here in America, 
he's beginning to give us understanding and it's like, oh my God, how come I never saw that before? So when you repeat your new story, it replaces and deletes the old story. You cannot delete your old story until you begin to repeat your new story. So the old story said for this woman, I'm hopeless, I'm dying, I'm bleeding, I can't touch anybody. But her new story said, oh, but I believe if I could just touch him, I believe everything would be just fine. That was eyes of her understanding being opened. Now, when Jesus came to earth, he gave understanding and he began to open people's eyes so that they could understand what they couldn't understand previously. Now listen to me carefully on this. I want to make sure I say this real clear so that you can get this and grab it. When Jesus came to the earth, he came from another world. Now he was God's son. He was the immaculate conception. He was God's son, is God's son. He died on Calvary. He became our savior. He became our resurrected Lord. But whenever he came, he came to bring information and understanding that the Old Testament never gave about the other world. The prophets prophesied. They talked about things that was going on in Israel. But when Jesus came, he was a brand new type of a prophet and he had great information. He brought great understanding. All of a sudden, we're learning about demons. All of a sudden, we're learning about divine healing. All of a sudden, we're learning about all kinds of things. And so when Jesus came, he's opening the eyes of understanding. So when Jesus came, he came like an Elijah to demonstrate to an Elisha, watch me, listen to me. I want to model something for you that when I'm gone, you can do what I have done. And so he said, just watch me and listen to me. And so when Jesus came, he came to open doors and to open doors of our understanding and open up our new eyes of understanding so that we could enter into a realm that mankind had never entered into before. That's what Jesus did. So what do I mean by that? <laughs> Whenever I say there's a difference between levels and dimensions. I hear people say all the time, oh my God, we're gonna enter into another level. Well, could I be honest with you and tell you, I'm not interested at all in entering into another level. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at communications. In the beginning, you had the telegraph. That was the first mode of communication. Look what happened right after the telegraph. It went to the telephone. You remember the telephone? You put that little thing down there up to your ear and you'd get in the mouthpiece there and you'd scream out, hello, can you hear me? You know, it went from telegraph to that kind of a telephone. Then it went to dial phones. Remember those? Then it went to push phones. Then it went to cell phone. Then it has gone to iPhones. You know how long that took? A hundred years for it to go from the telegraph to the iPhone. That's communication. It took a hundred years for it to go from the level of Telegraph to the iPhone. T took 100 years on that level. Took 100 years to develop that. Watch this. Computing. You remember those computers there? It was a whole room. It was a whole room. That's how computers started out right there. It was a whole room of computers. Then it went to the personal computer. See that? And then it went to the laptop, and then it went to the iPad. How long did it take? About 100 years. 
Look at this. Transportation. You remember the old Model T's and the old Model A's? You remember that? Look what happened. It went, we used to have a, a car like that. Ours was a 50 Chevrolet and it was blue. I remember that. I was so ashamed of that car. My dad would take me to school and I'd always hunker down in the seat until it was time to get out. And then it went to that kind of car. And then it went to this kind of car. And then it went to this kind of car. You see, to go from the Model A, the Model T, to something like this took close to 100 years. Transportation went from this level to another level and it took about 100 years to do it. Now watch this. You remember Kitty Hawk? Let's look and see what happened at Kitty Hawk. Then you had the Red Baron. Then you had the seaplane. Then you had the big carriers, double story carriers. Then you had the stealth fighters. Then you had the space shuttle. And now, today you've got this put out by Virgin where it's an intergalactic plane that can take you up in outer space on an airplane where there's weightlessness and to get from there all the way back to Kitty Hawk, about 100 years. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Watch this, there's one more. Here's, here's what I wanna share with you. From a level of computers, a level of communication, a level of travel by car, a level of air flight, it started off here, but it took about 100 years to get here and to get to that level, about 100 years. Now, <clears throat> when Jesus came, just want you to hear what I'm gonna say, and this is not new age, just want you to listen to me. <laughs> when Jesus came, he only talked about levels of faith, but he never talked about levels of development like that. So he said that there's different levels of faith. There's no faith, there's little faith, there's great faith. That's different levels of faith. But now, when Jesus came, he didn't talk about levels, he talked about dimensions. Dimensions, what is a dimension? It means it's here, he came to reveal it, he understood it, nobody before him could talk about it, nobody before him could explain it. There was a few little places in the Old Testament where an ax head swam, there was a few places in there where angels did different things and all that was great. But when Jesus came, he said, I have come to introduce you to dimensions. It's here and you don't have to wait for it to develop through a level. It is immediate. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Jesus' first miracle was the turning of the water into wine. How did that happen? They gave out a wine at the wedding his mother was there at the wedding and they run out and Jesus said, go fill the water pots with water. And they looked at Jesus' mother as if to say, what do you think about this? She said, do whatever he tells you to do. Whatever he says to you, do it. They filled the water pots with the water. They came back. And the Bible says that Jesus said to them, now dip in and go and serve the guest. And when they dipped in, it was immediate. And what did the person that was over the party say? He has saved the best to last. There was no maturation. There was no time lapse. It went from water to wine, and it was the best wine. How did it happen? Jesus tapped into another dimension. Watch this. <laughs> I'm telling you this, I'm asking God, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to do such a work in me. I'm asking this personally, do such a work in me, Lord, that before I die or before Jesus comes, I can get highly developed into this dimension of faith as we've never known before. And here's what it says. The Bible says, 
Jesus gathered, and they brought unto him all that were sick. There's a scripture up there on the screen. So they brought unto Jesus all that were sick. And whenever he got there, he looks out and he sees this mass of people. They're just everywhere. And um, they had all kinds of sicknesses, diseases, all kinds of things that was evident. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent into all the country round about and they brought unto him all that was diseased and besought him that they should just touch the hem of his garment. Because see, by now, they have heard about the woman that touched the hem of his garment and she was made whole. So that's the level that people latched on to. They latched on to the hem of his garment, hem of his garment. Boy, if you can just get the hem of his garment, you're gonna be all right. So they latched on to that. And so they, they besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And the Bible said, as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. Now, let's look at this. What is divine healing? Divine healing needs no scalpel. Divine healing does not need injections. Divine healing does not need convalescence time. Divine healing is boom, healed. The woman said, if I could just touch him, I know I'll be whole. Boom, she touched him and she was immediately made whole. I'm praying and I'm asking God to let the whole body of Christ before Christ comes. People have said, oh, Brother Kilpatrick, oh my God, things are so bad. Yes, they are. But I'm not going to let that be my story. I'm going to delete that old story and I'm going to create a new story. And what I'm going to say is, my God shall do great and mighty things in these last days. And so, when somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, do you think God can replace limbs? How many of y'all believe he can do that? Well, let me tell you something I saw at Brownsville. One night at Brownsville, it was like on a Tuesday night, revival hadn't been going on probably 30 days. The place was packed out every night, just people everywhere. I remember one night I stand on the platform with Steve and all of a sudden, during praise and worship, it would be during praise and worship that you could feel the heat of the Lord come in. And when we'd feel the heat of the Lord come in, we'd never mention it and say anything about it. But when you'd feel that heat, you know that the Lord was showing up to heal people. You, could, you just knew that that heat was healing people. And people would all, all of a sudden start yelling, oh my God, I'm healed, you know? Because everybody could feel it, but we never brought attention to it. So I remember one night, Steve and I was on the platform. And all of a sudden, there was this woman right down here and the place was just packed. People up against the platform, just heads and faces everywhere. And this woman was down here and she just started screaming. Ah! Well, I'm Pentecostal. <laughs> but if you're gonna scream in my church, you need a pretty good reason. So she started screaming and I just reached over and grabbed the handheld microphone and she was staring at her husband. Her husband's a big old burly guy. And she's staring at her husband. And so I walked down off the stage and I, walked, I was walking up to her to interview her. But she was still screaming. And she didn't even see me coming, didn't care that I was coming. She just staring at her husband. Well, her husband was an ex-Vietnam veteran. And while serving in Vietnam, they threw a grenade in on him. And when the grenade came in the tent, he picked the grenade up to throw it back out. And when he did, it got away from his hand, but it blew up and blew part of his hand off. His hand was growing back. I don't think you heard what I just said. His hand was growing back. I got there and I looked at what she was looking at. She never saw me. She was just <laughs> like this. She's shaking her hands and just stomping in place like, ah, ah like that and I thought well let me see what she's looking at and I saw the man's hand growing back and I said ah, 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 ah. so we screamed a duet for Jesus but let me tell you what I saw it was the most supernatural thing I've ever seen but the most natural looking thing I've ever seen it blew the skin off his fingers and his skin his fingers had real tight skin 
it blew a big moon in his hand here. When we was looking, and I got in on the tail end of it, but when we look at, looked at his hand, the meat was filling in like an invisible laser or something, like a sewing machine was sewing new skin on. It was like, and it was filling in. And I looked at that and I thought to myself, my God, how come we've never seen this before? It looked so natural, but yet it was supernatural. And when it was done, the new skin on the back of his hand matched his tan and the new skin on the bottom part of his hand matched the pink skin of his other hand. God don't do no junk, friend. Come on, give him praise. He don't do no junk. His hand, and we had him come back to Brownsville probably 30, 40, 50 times and show everybody what God did and testify about what God did. Now, let me just say this to you. If God ever did it once, he can do it again. It was a dimension. It was a dimension of healing. It wasn't just waiting like a doctor says to a person, you're gonna to have to have surgery. You're gonna to have to have this taken out. You're gonna to have to have this repaired. And we're gonna schedule it for two weeks from now. And after we cut you open and after we lay you open and we do the surgery, it's gonna take you about six weeks to recover. And then after you get home and recover, it's gonna take you a while before you can go back to work. Now what the doctor's talking about here is a time element. You're gonna come in on this level, you're gonna have surgery, but it's gonna take about six to eight weeks to get you to this level of recovery. What Jesus is talking about is they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's not gonna be a convalescent time. It's not gonna be a surgical scalpel. It's not gonna be needles. It's not gonna, it's gonna be divine healing by the power of the glory of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Listen to me, friend. I believe that we're about to enter into a time in these last days, critical days, serious, perilous times. Just as things get really bad and they get really dark, that's when God's gonna show up and do his greatest work. So we can't be overcome by the darkness, but we've gotta overcome the darkness by the light. Arise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. Woo, come on, give God praise. Woo! Listen to this. Go to Jesus feeding the hungry. Put that on the screen for me, Aaron. Jesus feeding the hungry. I wanna show you something here. This is so powerful. Jesus is such a, a pioneer. It said when Jesus came out, he saw much people. He was moved with compassion toward them and they were like sheep not having a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. Back up just a minute. He began to teach them many things. Everybody say that out loud with me. He began to instruct them. He began to teach them. When you teach somebody something, it's things they didn't know. He taught them many things. And so when the day was now far spent, it was late in the afternoon, they'd been there with him all day. His disciples came unto him and said, Lord, this is a desert place. The time is far past now. If we send these people away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages, let's just send them away and let them buy some bread because they have nothing to eat. And Jesus answered and said unto them, he said, the disciples said, shall we go into town? Now here's 5,000 people. Here's Jesus, 12 disciples. They're faint, they've been there all day. If you send the crowd home, many of them's gonna faint on the way home because they had nothing to eat. And so the disciples said, this is their way of thinking. See, this is human thinking, human thinking. The disciples said, should we go into town and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? In other words, 
when we buy the bread and when we get the meat and everything, we're going to have to prepare it for them, get ready for it. It's going to take a while to get over there. It's going to take a long time to get back. By then it's going to be dark, but at least we can give them something to eat. Then they can go home. Jesus just said this. Well, how many loaves, take an assessment of your assets. He said, how many loaves is here today in this crowd? And they said, well, five. And there's a little boy here, he's got a few fish. There's five loaves and there's a few fish. Jesus said this. You see, <laughs> this is what I love. Jesus is not intimidated by levels. See, the disciples is thinking in terms of, we got to go buy some bread. We got to go buy something. We got to take time to get over there, take time to get back. Then we got to prepare it. And this is just the way it is, Jesus. Jesus is saying, hey, I've got an idea. Take an asset, an assessment of your assets, bring me the bread. And the Bible said that Jesus held the bread up like this and he blessed it. Now listen to me. If you ever want something to multiply, don't pray over it, bless it. There's things that you pray over that means you're soliciting heaven for divine intervention. You're petitioning God for divine intervention. There's things that you will prophesy over. You'll reach out into the future, get something, bring it into the present, prophesy over it, let it go, and it's gonna to come to pass. Then there's some things that you don't pray over or prophesy over, there's some things that you bless. If you want something to multiply, if you'll notice when Jesus was here on the earth, if something needed to multiply, he always blessed it. And so he held it up and he blessed it. Look what it says. He said, all right, now tell them to sit down by companies upon the green grass. They sat down in ranks, hundreds and fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves, he blessed, break the loaves, gave it to the disciples, set before them two fish, divided them among them all. And they did all eat and they were all filled. Now look this way just for a minute. Nobody went to the store. Nobody walked into town. Nobody spent 200 penny worth of bread. Nobody bought no bread. Nobody bought no fish. They all had it right there. It was enough. It wasn't enough, but it was loaves and it was five fish. Five fish, uh, five loaves and a few fish. Nobody went and bought nothing. Jesus said, there's a better way. I want you to watch me because the things that I do, you can do also. And he said, I'm gonna go back to the Father and the things that I do, you'll do also. How many of you still believe that? Because he said, I go back to the Father. So he said, have them sit down. And then he gave it to the disciples. And here's what happened. The 5,000 people had five loaves. There's 12 disciples. He broke those loaves, made sure that everybody had a little bit of a loaf. And he said, now break it off. And when they started breaking it off, listen, the bread that they broke off was already cooked, already baked, was the same bread as what they just broke off of. What did he do? He tapped into another dimension. Amen. Let me tell you something. Don't kid yourself for one minute. The false prophet and the antichrist and the antichrist spirit has some real surprises up their sleeve and they're just about to deceive the masses of mankind. But understand this, God will not let them get an upper leg on him. God is gonna have his church and his church will do great exploits and his church will do greater things. And Jesus said this, he said, you'll do these things and greater because I go back to my father. And I wanna tell you something, if you're one of those people that's given up on miracles, I want you to know I have not given up on miracles. I believe they're about to break out like nobody's ever seen before. Somebody shout amen. amen. Woo! So he came to, to introduce us to dimensions. He healed, he fed the thousands. And then look what he said to, about Lazarus. I wanna show you this. This is so interesting. 
Lazarus. Put it on the screen. Martha said unto him, she, she, you know, she told you, she said, if you'd just been here, my brother wouldn't have died. If you'd just been here. Jesus looked at Martha and he said, Martha said, I know he'll rise again at the last day. Now let's just leave that on the screen just for a minute. Let me show you how human beings think. I know that he'll rise again. I have faith for it. When Jesus said, well, tell me about your faith now. Tell me about the quality of faith that you got. When do you believe he'll rise again? At the last day. Why do you believe he'll rise at the last day? Because it's going to take time. And you know what? Jesus interrupted her and said, you know what, honey? I am the resurrection and I am the life. You're thinking, you said, if I'd have been here yesterday, you had faith for yesterday and you got faith for tomorrow, but you don't have faith for right now. Are you listening to what I'm saying? He's saying, you said if I'd just been here yesterday, your brother wouldn't have died. Well, I wasn't here and I wasn't here on purpose because I'm trying to introduce you to a dimension of my presence. And I want you to see it firsthand. I have not abandoned you. Things may look one way, but I'm about to show you my glory. Hallelujah. And then she said, I know he'll rise in the resurrection at the last day. And what she was saying is, I, my faith is way out yonder. My faith is way out there at the last day. And Jesus had to step up and say, oh, but Mary, you humans. Could I paraphrase here, baby? What Jesus was saying is, Mary, you humans. Y'all have this thing about yesterday and you have this thing about tomorrow. But Mary, I have access to a dimension that I can bring it back right now. Listen to me. When I tell you that the false prophet and the Antichrist are about to be revealed here before too long, there's gonna be such a spirit of deception. And the Bible says that the Antichrist and the false prophet will work together for the whole length of the tribulation period. And the false prophet will be able to do miracles in the eyes of all the nations of the world. The cameras will be there to pick up on it. Somebody said, well, will the church still be here? I hope not. But if we are, God is not gonna let the Antichrist and the false prophet have the last word on miracles. So here's what I'm trying to say to you. Right now, let's get out ahead of this thing and let's start experiencing miracles right now because as time goes along, we're gonna need some really powerful miracles to stand up against what the false prophet and the Antichrist are gonna be perpetrating on the nations of the world. Let the church be the church and these signs shall follow them that believe. We will move into another dimension and God will give us things that will shock the nations of the world. That's where we're headed. Pre-COVID days are gone. Now that COVID has come in, everything has changed. And I say, thank God everything has changed. And they're gonna change even more quickly in the days to come. Hallelujah. Let me close by covering a couple of other things real quickly. I want to show you how we get so locked in. <laughs> it's amazing that sometimes we get so locked in on the things that we understand and we believe our understanding is the right understanding and we're not going to change for anybody. I want to show you something so profound in Scripture. Peter is up on the rooftop praying. <laughs> And on the morrow, as they went on their journey, they drew nigh into the city. Peter went up on the rooftop to pray, and it was about the sixth hour. Now, just really look at this. This is so amazing. Just look at this. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, while they were getting dinner prepared down below in the house, he was up on the rooftop, he fell into a trance. That means an open vision while he was awake. 
A dream is while you're asleep. An open vision is you're awake and your eyes are wide open. It's a trance. You're seeing images and pictures in a video. You're wide awake, you're not asleep, and it's rolling before you just like a video. He fell into a trance and he saw all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descended as if it was a great sheet. And it was knit at the four corners. In other words, it was caught at the four corners to keep things from spilling out. And it was let down to the earth. And the Lord spoke to Peter in a voice and said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And here was all kinds of unclean animals that the Jews would never touch. Hoofed animals, all kinds of stuff. They'd never touch it. Now, let, let me just stop right there just for a minute. Listen to what I'm going to tell you. This is the understanding that Peter was standing under. What is understanding? It's the level of truth that you're standing under. Jesus knew that Peter was standing under a level of truth that was traditional and it was Jewish, but it did not fit what God was trying to teach him. Look what happened. Peter said, no, not so, Lord. Can you imagine? Listen to me. Can you imagine a man saying to the Lord, no, I'm a Jew. Don't you understand who I am? You're talking to a Jew. He said, not so, Lord. And he said, I've never eaten anything that's common or unclean. Now, let's just stop right there. What he was saying is, I would like to brag on my self-righteousness. I'd like to brag on my self-righteousness and just tell you just how traditional I really am. I'm a real Jew, Jesus. I would never do that. And look what happened the second time. The voice spake unto him the second time. The Lord said, what I have cleansed, don't call uncommon. Now look here. First time God spoke to him, Peter said, not so, Lord. He contradicted the Lord. Second time the Lord spoke to him, and Peter said, no. He said, don't call uncommon what I have blessed. And so this happened three times. Look, everybody. Peter contradicted the Lord three times. Now, let me just stop right here and ask you a question. Does Peter know who's talking to him? He's the God of the universe. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But what Peter is talking about is he's telling Jesus about what level of understanding and what level of truth he's at. And his level of truth is contradicting God's level of truth. And God's doing his best to stretch him out of that into another level of understanding. Look what happened. It happened back up the last verse. This was done thrice and the vessel was then pulled back up into heaven. In other words, he would not yield to the Lord. He would not listen to the Lord. And the Lord just pulled it back up into heaven. Just, he said, pull it back up. He made him the offer three times. Here, Peter, kill and eat. No! Here, Peter, kill. No! Don't call common what I, don't call uncommon what I've called common. No! The Lord said, okay, retrieve it. So while Peter doubted in himself that the vision which he'd seen, what it should mean, the men were sent from Cornelius' house and made inquiry outside of Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Peter was there. Is Peter lodged, is Peter lodged here? And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, there's three men at the gate. I want you to go with them. So he arose. He got down like the Lord told him to. He said, go with them. Don't doubt anything. I've sent them. When Peter went down to the men which were sent up to him from Cornelius, he said, I'm the one you're seeking. I'm Peter. I'm Simon Peter. Why have you come? What's the cause of your visit? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a Gentile, has sent us 
He's a man that fears God. He's a man of good report among all the nation of the Jews. And he was warned from God by a holy angel to send for you into this house at this address. And we're to hear your words. So he called them in and lodged them, put them up for the night. When the morning came, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa and accompanied these three guys. And it took a day to get there. And when they entered into Caesarea, Cornelius was waiting for them. And he had called them all together, his kinsmen and his near friends, a bunch of Gentiles in the house. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet. A Gentile fell down at Peter's feet and grabbed him and Peter said, get up. Don't do that. I'm just a man like you are. And so Peter took him up and said, stand up. I am myself just a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, you know it's unlawful that me as a Jew, I shouldn't even come under the roof of this Gentile people. But then that vision had a chance to work in him, see? When God let it down through him three times and he disagreed with God three times, he contradicted God three times. Now it's had about 24 hours to work in him. And now he said this, he said, but God has shown me that I should not call uncommon or clean, unclean what God has pronounced clean. And look what it says. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. I asked therefore what intent you have sent for me. And Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth I perceive. Oh my God, there it is. That God is no respecter of persons. Now let me stop right here. Let me, let me start right here. Listen to me. How did that information come to Peter? It was a vision. And the voice of God talked to him. It wasn't through UPS. It wasn't through FedEx. It wasn't through Amazon. Can you believe that? It wasn't through any other means but a, another dimension. He's up on the rooftop. Freezes, eyes wide open, a video is going in front of him and a voice is talking to him. A sheet's let down. It's another dimension speaking to him. Right there on the rooftop. Don't you call in clean. Pulls the sheet back up. He can't get it out of his mind. It works on him 24 hours. Now he goes to Cornelius' house and when he gets to Cornelius' house, he preaches the Holy Spirit to him. And while he's preaching the Holy Spirit to him, they were so anxious to hear about the Holy Spirit that they all had experienced. While he was still preaching, the Holy Spirit fell on everybody in the house and they all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, where did that information come? From another dimension. Let me say this to you real quickly and I'm gonna close. Like I told you, this is just one part. This is just one message. I think I have seven or eight other messages on this. It's called the eyes of your understanding. But in dreams, whoa, what is a dream? A God dream. It comes from another dimension. You're on your bed. The Bible calls it slumberings and the Bible calls it deep sleep. Listen to me carefully. Deep sleep is REM sleep. You're deep. And the Bible said, when deep sleep falleth upon man, God speaketh once, yea, twice. God does what? In deep sleep, when man is on his bed, God speaks once, yea, twice. From another dimension. You're not moving. The temperature's right. You're covered up. It's dark. And God's speaking to your spirit, man, from another dimension. And he's showing you things. And when you wake up, you've got it. Where did you get it from? Another dimension. God told Joseph in a dream, don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, because that which is conceived in her is a holy thing. Spoke to him in a dream. Used another dimension to get a hold of a man that his girlfriend was pregnant 
that was worried about what people would say, God used another dimension to speak to him and said, I'll take care of all the details. You just take care of her. And God used another dimension called dreams to warn Joseph not to abandon Mary because the father of this child is the Holy Spirit. Another dimension. Listen, they're all around us. We're so caught up today with things. We're so caught up with things that we worry about. Sickness, pandemic, shots, vaccinations. Biden, Trump. My God, that's a plate flow right there. We're caught up for this, we're caught up for that. And the devil's doing a masterful job right now of sidetracking the church. But here's what I'm saying, get that out of your mind and get that out of your spirit. God is about to rise up and do great and mighty things in these last days. And I can't wait to see what God is about to do. Will you give me just a few more minutes? Will you give me just a few more minutes? Is this okay? Let me talk to you for a minute about dreams. It said, deep sleep is REM sleep. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men and slumberings upon their bed, it uses two words here. Deep sleep is REM sleep. That means when you're very deep into sleep, you're gone, you're asleep. You're not half awake, you're deep into sleep. And the Bible says, in a vision of the night, it is a vision. It is a vision. You're in deep sleep and God is a spirit and God can send the Holy Spirit into your spirit because it's not substance. He can send his spirit into your spirit and cause you to dream whatever he wants you to dream. God can take his finger and, des pull and design the tributary that he wants you to dream in and to dream and see it in technicolor. And God speaks to you in a vision of the night. And then slumberings is not REM sleep, but it means when you're coming out of sleep. And that's usually when God speaks to me the most, when I'm coming out of sleep. It's like I'm coming up out of a well. And as I'm coming up out of that well, I can already hear the Lord talking to me. He's already talking while I'm coming up. And he's speaking to me about a message I'm gonna be preaching. He's speaking to me about something that's going on in the world. And he's already talking and I'm slumbering in my bed. I'm slumbering. I'm not asleep, but I'm not awake. Herod's wife said, when Jesus was standing before Herod, Herod's wife sent a note to her husband. She said, Herod, you have nothing to do with that man. I had a morning dream this morning, slumberings upon my bed. And she said, the things I saw, she said, don't you have a thing, don't you touch him, don't you put your hands on this man. Herod got right up, washed his hands over a bowl of water and dried him off and he said, his blood won't be on my hands. He turned back over to the high priest. That dream that his wife had may have saved Herod's life. Slumberings upon her bed. Don't you ever, don't you ever minimize in this day and time especially that when you go to bed at night that God's not gonna speak to you in your sleep. Matter of fact, I've got to where it's like when I get ready for bed, I'll brush my teeth. I'll go in, I do my little thing that I get ready, I'd go to bed, pull the cover up, cut the light out. And this is the way I'm going to bed every night now. I'm saying, Lord, I wanna know. I wanna know. I don't wanna be kept in the dark. Lord, if you'll tell me, if you'll show me, I'll with wisdom show me, show others what you're showing me. But Lord, I wanna know. Show me, talk to me while I'm asleep. I've actually got up and went to the bathroom in a dream while I'm dreaming and come back and said, all right, now, Lord, continue the dream. <laughs> and the Lord continued the dream. You know, we all have to take bathroom breaks occasionally. You know what I'm saying? 
and just, when I wake up, it's like, man, I just knew. But look at this scripture, though. This is so interesting. Look at this scripture. It said, when deep sleep falls upon men, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep comes upon men, slumberings upon their bed. In verse 16, it says, he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Oh my goodness, what? He opens the ears of men. You mean these ears? No, not these ears. No. If you heard, if you was asleep and you heard something with these ears, it'd wake you up. He opens men's ears, inside ears, inside eyes, and seals their instruction, seals it. You might not even know what it is, but when you wake up, you know something's changed. Then the Bible says this that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. I looked up that word. He opens the ears of men, seals their instruction. That word instruction comes from the word mokar, mosar. And it means instruction or admonition. What God says is in, a, in, a, in sleep, something that's happening to you that you're, God's speaking to you from another dimension. He's giving you an admonition. It's an act of warning. He's notifying you of a fault in your life that he wants you to correct. He's giving you counsel against some evil practices. Maybe you're dabbling in pornography. God's gonna to talk to you while you're asleep. He's trying to talk to you while you're awake, but there's too much interruptions. But while you're asleep, he's gonna to talk to you. He's gonna open your ears. You're gonna hear him. It's a Mosar, it's an instruction, it's an admonition, it's an act of warning, and it means nine things. Admonition means nine things. To caution, to advise, to exhort, to instruct, to direct, to remind, to recall, urge to duty, and to imprint. God resorts to the dimension of dreams to bypass your pride because when you're awake, your pride would not let the Lord talk to you. But when you're asleep, he disarms your pride and he comes right in and says what he wants to say and he knows you got it. The Bible says that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. Pride cloaks and conceals sinful intentions. When we have sinful intentions, planning on leaving our wife, leaving our husband, we're planning on doing something that we know is not right. <clears throat> we have sinful intentions. The Bible says that he'll hide pride from men. And when we hide behind that pride, we fall prey to self-deception. So dreams strip away pride, defenses, and invades areas of your hidden intentions, and God will point them out to you. And he'll say, I know what you're up to. I see your sinful plans. It's complex structures of iniquity in the mind. And dreams plead with you. God pleads with you in dreams to abandon those plans and those evil ways and to do what's right. He'll plead with you in your dream. Dreams have the ability to take those protected intents and thoughts of your heart and cause us to see them and be startled by them so that when we wake up, we don't have pride there defending those things anymore. And we wake up startled and we, we, we're ready to repent because God finally got through to us. And there was no centurions there of pride to keep the Lord away. The dimensions of dreams are very common and they're very profound. So I close today. And what I want to say is, Somewhere down the line, I don't know where, but it's happening over a long period of time. Somewhere down the line, Pentecostals have gotten away from the prophetic. And Pentecostals have gotten away from the power of the Holy Spirit. And Pentecostals have gotten away from tongues, interpretation of tongues, discerning of spirits, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Somehow, Pentecostals have gone into the soul, but we've abandoned the spirit. And we love soulish things, and we love soulish preaching, 
but we don't want to hear much about spirit preaching. And so what the Holy Spirit is saying to me is this. Tell the people and warn the people. Return to me because I'm about to show them great and mighty things. Go ahead. Lord spoke to me recently, and he said this. He said, I'm about to show housewives things that the greatest of preachers never knew. Just normal housewives are about to come in contact with revelation knowledge that even some of his most powerful preachers has never seen before. This is about to happen. Why? The times require it, and the times demand it. So listen, in heaven there'll be no more mysteries. While we're here, the Lord's saying, I'm going to reveal all the mysteries before my coming. Tell the people to get ready when they go to sleep and say, Lord, show me mysteries. Show me what you want to show me. Tell me what you want to tell me. And make sure you ground it in doctrine. Make sure you ground it in sound doctrine. But in the days to come, this is my last statement, in the days to come, you're going to begin to hear and see things that is going to make your mouth fly open and you're going to say, oh my God. The Antichrist is not going to share this stage in the last days by himself. God is going to do great and mighty things. God bless you. Thank you very much. Hallelujah. Let's stand up and give God praise. Come on, give him praise. Lift your voice. Woo. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your voices just for a moment. Just for a moment. Lift your voice. Hallelujah. Put your hands on your head, please. I release dreams and visions. I release dreams and visions in this house. Up in the balcony, on the main floor, live streaming audience. I release dreams and visions. Dreams be loosed. Visions be loosed. And dimensions of the Spirit of God that this church has never realized are floating before. I release those dimensions of the Spirit of God for you to begin to move in and out of it with ease. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah.